So the, the, these talks were all, all uh, wonderful, and most of them were, were terrifying. I feel at the end of this session, uh, as though I just discovered that uh, I'm like a mouse among dinosaurs. That is, there are these gigantic, well-funded forces corrupting research in, <laughs> in, in the sciences, gigantic, well-funded forces hijacking uh, uh, the media. Um, it was uh, really uh, um, a rather despair-inducing session. The uh, advice that we've gotten so far, and I think that's one of the points of, our, of this session here, is to figure out, well, what are we going to do now? Uh, the advice seems to me largely, well, we each have to try a little harder, and we have to maybe get a little better educated in how to talk to the media. This seems to me really, really inadequate. Um, I think maybe we're just beyond our abilities here in figuring out how to respond to this, how to influence legislation, how to influence the culture. Uh, and I wonder if it isn't time for us to start thinking um, uh, about hiring PR firms, about having uh, some, you know, we, we, it was pointed out uh, by Chris that there's no PAC. Um, it seems as though we have to get some, uh, be it uh, advertising people, be it uh, political consultants. Um, I think us sitting around and trying to brainstorm uh, is really not going to get us very far. What do you guys think? And do you have any, do you have any uh, suggestions for really making this more of an organized response by science to changes in the culture? Well, I want to just jump in because, you know, I, I got a lot of, interestingly enough, it said that, you know, we should, we, we need to do public relations. We need to learn to do sound bites. And scientists really got upset at that fact because there are groups that do, you know, have done this very effectively. Intelligent Design in particular have done it very effectively in terms of media relations and sound bites. Um, but I think that there are, I think that scientific organizations, a lot of them are beginning to realize the need for more savvy media relations. But you can also, I, I, there, I think you shouldn't be as just, Bearers as you were, in a, in a sense, by this, because um, there are there there are, you can be incredibly effective. In fact, we did sort of create a pack in Ohio. We we created a program that, and, and when the public is, learns a little bit, it's amazing how effective it, it can be. We I created an organization that funded that recruited anti uh, candidates for school board, state school board, that would run against creationist candidates. That was outspent six to one in every, but won every single race. Because the minute the issues were raised and the public knew a little bit about it, um, uh, uh, it, it was clear to them. So I think um, you, uh, it, it is possible, at, at, but you have to be organized. But you can do it without excessive, uh, I, I think, money to begin to have it to begin to have an impact. But but I agree with you that we have to um, consider consider at least taking understanding that when it comes to the media, sound bites and um, man, manipulating opinion is sometimes as important as facts. Well, is that a good thing, though? I mean, uh, what, 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 I mean, it's not a good obviously thing. But, one of the things you, that we're doing here, if you look on the website here, at least it says freedom from the tyranny of the soundbite. Yeah. One of the reasons that we do this is so that there's a place where people can go and get the full story. I'm not averse, incidentally, to doing highlights and, and short pieces that direct people to the, to the full. But it's, it's kind of debasing, isn't it, to imagine that the, the only thing that the public can understand is sound bites or spin? Well, it, it, yeah, but it's reality. Uh, it, at the same time, I mean, you want to try and raise the level of public discourse, but it's what I've. But you know, the last I, I'd say to teachers, the biggest mistake you make is assuming your students have are interested in what you have to say. I, uh, I, I think Johnson's and, and right. It's true it? for everything. So you have to seduce people, and if you want to get to the level of intelligent discourse, you first have to capture their interest. And this is framing. I, I, it's a science. Also, you know, Look, Jonathan's it's right. It's We've got to get people like Gates and Spielberg off on our side. They're going to lose in the long term when these young people don't come through and they've got this mystical stuff. At the moment, the academic community is fighting this fight against the Discovery Institute, the evolution. It, who do they come to? The National Academy of Sciences. Who are the people? Going to, they're going to listen to Bill Gates. They're going to listen to Spielberg. They're going to listen to people in industry. I'm with you. Let's get these guys organized and get them together and, and help us. But they're just sitting there no, not saying a word. What's Warren Buffett so and say about this? Does he say anything? No. It's about time they came off their high horses, t making money, and come down to the brass backs and help us to solve some of these problems. But, uh, well, I would say that Sorry, actually, Christian. for one thing, it's, it, there are a lot of specific recommendations that are domain specific, and we shouldn't assume that there's only one sort of form of solution that affects all of the problems. I have a lot of specific solutions in my own arena. One thing I failed to mention is that right now, 
I lose performance pay every time I fail to inflict drugs on patients that guidelines generated by people, all of whom have conflict of interest, have made, where the evidence says those people will not receive benefit exceeding harm. One obvious solution is have only methods experts on guideline generating panels. Do not allow, quote, domain experts who have any drug company conflicts. Another um, is insist, have journals insist well, well, that in order for a drug company funded study to be published, they have to make their database available on a public access basis. Excuse me. I, th I think in your area, all the things that you say, which I thought were superb, are more actionable. And, and we've got little limited time. Okay. What I'm talking about here is this amorphous, how do you get a better vision of science out there? And how do you get people interested in all this sort of thing? I think the sort of stuff that you're doing, it would be, it would be relatively easy, I suspect, to get a group of concerned people together to actually get behind that, because you've got such a very clear path there. I mean, we don't seem to have a path this here. Is, this has been done, and there's data on it. And the problem is that actually a lot of people who care about science don't look at the data from the people who study communication and the media. If you look at the California Stem Cell Initiative, there was a massive communications campaign to support the initiative, and it won, and it changed public opinion, and you can show exactly how they did it. And in fact, my colleague Matthew Nisbet in his lectures and his publication shows what the message was, how much they spent on advertising, how public opinion changed, how they won a huge amount of money for embryonic stem cell research. You want to do that with another issue? It's easy. It's just really expensive. Uh, the question is, do, you, do the people who care about science care enough? The expertise already exists. Uh, we know how to figure out what messages will work for which audiences, and we know how to figure out what media Outlets will reach them. Political campaigns do it. It's just a question of investment. It is rarely ever done. The California Stem Cell Initiative is an example in which it was done, did work. There's lots of other big issues where it, I would argue that it would be incredibly beneficial to replicate that, but it's very rare. But you're talking about a very specific issue that was framed in terms of people's health. And exactly. And, and you couldn't talk about the details of science when you, with your television ads. You have to talk about how the stem cell, you know, if you fund this initiative, you're going to advance the state's future. You are going to find medical cures. It's going to be good for California. That's when about you, all you can but say. But when you get into the area we were talking about with Nita or with Erin or Amanda about, about um, predictiveness in law and use of that in, in, in legal decisions and so on, that's so much more woolly, isn't oh, it? Oh, absolutely. I mean, yeah, I mean, this, there's, there's several scientific issues where I would argue that a mass communication campaign is needed. Uh, and then there's all different kinds of communication. And, and in fact, yeah. to go back to Beatrice's point, it sounds to me like the, the thing that you were talking about, if you had the right people supporting you, and if they were not in the pay of drug companies, they, they in fact could support something like the stem cell initiative and, 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 and clean up that house, right? I mean, that should, ought to be a clearer and easier thing to do. That's easy to say if you discount the fact that there are billions of dollars in special interests that might choose to try to put out a message on the opposite side. Well, that, yeah, that'll happen right. too. Well, yeah. but, there is, you're, but you have a network where you can have an hour long or through hour long or three hour long program. Um, and I, I think you have to realize that that's wonderful, but, it's but there are lots of different aspects of communication. In a newspaper, you've got 700 words. In a TV program, you have a minute and a half, I mean a news program. And so you have to compromise. But I think what you want to do, what you, the real goal is to get people interested enough so that they can turn to Drill the down sources. to the next source. Yeah, they can go on to the next source. You'll right. you never real, fully explain anything. Yeah. I was playing devil's advocate. Yeah, I don't disagree you'll never with do you. it at the, at the first level. You, yeah. You've got to go to the second level. Well, that's, the, that's, that's, the, that's the, the pathway that goes from a simple thing that's, where somebody says, I'm John Haidt and I think science rocks, all the way to here's, an, <laughs> here's a one-hour interview with John Haidt. Yeah, I mean, I mean, so, you know, there's a, there's but a reason to drive Star Trek from one to the other the somehow, right? Yeah. yeah. If, if I may just quickly address your question about a, a PAC, there is a science PAC model that's proven successful. Um, my realm is ocean, so that's what I can talk about. But Ocean Champions formed just a few years ago, and what they do is they make campaign contributions. So um, they 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 don't have you know that nonprofit, nonpartisan need that a lot of academic institutions do. They're successful. They're the, in, they're the group that meets with Congress members, and they help organize with this other group, Communication Partnership for Science and Sea. It's known as COMPASS, based at Oregon State University, um, headed by Jane Lipchenko. They organize the Oceans, uh, the Oceans Caucus in Congress. They bring in some of the best scientists, and 
they are in the offices of senators and congressmen, and they were instrumental in passing the Magnuson-Stevens uh, Fishery Management and Conservation Act, which was 10 years overdue, but through this group, you know, through their influence, they made it happen. So it's been done in a small way, and I think we can use that model, speaking to Jack Stern and Dave Wilmot and the people that started that initiative, to really learn how to do it in a broader way across areas. I mean, one of the outcomes from these meetings has been that a lot of people start talking to each other, and perhaps that's one of the things we need to do with this. Is, is I want to hear a little bit more from Beatrice. I, of all the bad news I heard in this conference, I thought hers was the, the most terrifying. I mean, if funding is cut or media is not paying enough attention to science and so forth, that's bad. But the, the system decaying from within, as you portrayed it, seems really terrifying. And it doesn't seem like there's actually an easy solution to it from the way you, 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 you presented things. So um, what do you suggest? That I didn't hear. Right. Well, you know, there's a limited time for the talk, and I wasn't sure people would be interested in specific solutions. Um, but as I said, a couple that I just suggested include um, having only methods experts who have no conflicts be allowed on guideline generating panels, reforming the publishing system, and I've actually published my suggestion on how to do that, um, demanding that drug company uh, databases from which their studies are published be made public access. Federally funded studies actually have to be made public access if they're beyond a certain money amount after a couple of years. Drug company funded studies don't. One example of the repercussions of this is right, right now data do not show higher death rate in women with higher cholesterol and most of the studies have not separately published mortality data for women. The two that did both had the biggest um, reductions in death rate in the total population because they were the highest heart risk, but no reduction or even a slight increase in death in women. Twice we tried to get data from the rest of the statin trials. We sent gift incentives, registered mail, et cetera. The first time around we got one response back from a PI of an investigator who said they weren't going to share the data because they were going to publish their own sex-specific meta-analysis, which they ultimately did, but it failed to include total mortality findings, which are the findings that balance risks and benefits to the patient. The sec second time we tried, the principal investigator of the largest ever done statin study wrote back and said they weren't going to share the data because they didn't think total mortality was a relevant endpoint. Gee, whether people live or die, not relevant. How interesting is that for preventive medication? So public access data is obviously incredibly important, and journals could insist on that in order to have um, something be published. And also, obviously, medical education needs to be reformed with no involvement of industry. I like that use of the word endpoint about mortality. <laughs> Walter. Uh, I'm one thing that I think is important is that you know, scientists don't have, or many of us, don't have control over the state government and so on. It takes an awful lot. You know, it'd be easy to set this up. Sure, it'd be easy, right? But one thing we do have control over is our own institutions. And I think it's important to change the incentive structure for the young scientists because, as I see it right now, you know, people who are assistant professors and even associate professors, they're not getting rewarded for public outreach. I know people who uh, actually have had senior colleagues criticize them for spending time on public outreach. That's a waste of time. And if that kind of attitude continues, we're not going to have enough people to go out and do the outreach. And then no matter how good the structures are, uh, they're not going to work because it's going to take a lot of people doing it. Uh, so I, I suggest we all need to go home, and if any colleague says, you know, you're wasting your time doing that, then you've got to stand up to them and say, no, that's part of our the job is to be a scientist. Yeah, well, I, I just come back on the other side. How can he? How, well, yeah. I come back on the other side and say I'm a little worried that you know if you go to if you apply to the National Science Foundation or many places for a grant when you're young, you ha there has to be this outreach and teaching component, and and most people have at that stage ha haven't done any of that. And I actually, you know, young people come to me all the time and say I want to do what you're doing, okay? And I say the best thing you could do if you're a young scientist, you're good at, it, is do science and the opportunities for outreach will arise. I think we shouldn't make it a requirement for everyone. In fact, there's some, many scientists we really have to keep away from the public. <laughs> but but, but uh, uh, I, I think we want to, you, you're right, we want to have an incentive structure, but I'm a little worried about, the, about this fact. I, I really do think that young scientists, particularly right now, are overburdened with so many extra requirements to actually be, do the science is, is, is difficult. And I think, uh, but, but at the same time, I, I want to come back and say that the way we teach, uh, getting back to what Cheryl said, uh, as a uh, former chair of a physics department, and I'm sure it's true in most other fields, we tend to teach p young people as if they're going to be clones of us. 
But in fact, as the data sheet pointed out, was, most of them are never going to be academic scientists. If we believe physics or whatever field we're in is useful, and I think it is useful for people to learn in another area, we should teach people as if we're training them not to be scientists, but something else. And, we, and, and, and it's very important. Uh, and, and, and it works. We, we created six new physics majors when I was chair of the department, tripled the number of physics students because we said we're not training, you know, we're not training physicists. We're training people who are going to learn how to use the problem solving techniques of physics it, to be lawyers or to be or to whatever. And uh, so I think, I think, you know, in the teaching and training level, it's very important. And, and another, uh, one more thing, I was once a visiting committee at MIT. When we're teaching communication skills to young people who are scientists, we tend to do it as something called column B. It's not valued. You take this course in writing once when you're an undergraduate. In order for them to value it, it has to be in the courses. The physics teacher has to teach communication. The engineering professor has to teach communication so that their mentors, the people they respect, uh, tell them they have to learn how to communicate. Let me uh, remind you that there's something called the Union of Concerned Scientists, which has tens of thousands of members, which is very active. Uh, politically and has been very effective in picking their targets like uh, like the implanting of uh, form former former uh, lobbyists uh, to be managers of uh, of government agencies and they've picked on the names of these people and published them and and uh, gotten rid of a number of those uh, be, you know in, in the present government it's pretty pretty remarkable it's a good organization and tries very hard and in fact it has, uh, it has a fair amount of money because of dues. And one other thing about perverse incentives that's worth pointing out. I mean, we can talk all we want about the funding structure and how the funding structure supports those who have already published. So young emerging scientists who might have the most creative ideas because they're at the earliest part of their career are struggling just to keep up with the grant writing process and unable to concentrate on their research. But one, one side note that I think is also worth highlighting is it's, it's almost the case, and it's a, well, it's the case for a lot of people that they've learned to change their grant proposals to, to, to tailor them toward where they're better assured funding. So it could be not putting the term evolution in the title. They'll say population biology. <laughs> it's the same thing, but maybe the person deciding where the funding is going doesn't know that. Um, it's applying through Department of Defense instead of NIH because if this could have some military application, it's going to be funded. So perverse incentives is an enormous problem, and I think that's something that will have to be revisited over and over till we get over some of these humps. Oh, and quickly. Uh, yeah, quickly. Um, uh, the, um, Roger put the question to you, and I think this was the nature of the discussion, how can we better represent science to the world? And that's a good question, but I have a concern that I think there's something deep uh, behind, for example, Mrs. Palin's uh, willingness uh, to speak, for example, about her views about global warming. And not to take us back to old times, but 2,500 years ago, Plato said that there's this problem with democracy, that there's a tendency for everybody to think they're entitled to their own opinion. Now, that will, would suggest to me that the, the, what needs to be taught is not so much science, I'm not sure how universal science education can be, and I'm interested in what Leon thinks about this, that little kids should be taught that there are things like logic, reason, respect for evidence, and expertise. I think that, not to sound like an elitist, but I am, uh, <laughs> uh, I think that's actually something that is really, I, I, I'm afraid that the scientists in this room keep missing this. This is part of the problem, that there is a, presumption in our kind of democratic society that everybody's entitled to their own opinion about everything. And I think that's part of the problem, and I think that's a deep educational problem. Epistemology, since you, know, this is, you always favor your own discipline, I think we philosophers think that we know how to teach reason and logic and respect for evidence. And it seems as a tribe that we have more respect for science, I think, than most other tribes. Well, speak we, tribally. Uh, can I, the, can one I of, answer? One of, the, one of the bookend quotes that we always use with this science uh, network one of the is things, the one from Daniel Patrick Moynihan, which is oh. that everyone's entitled to an opinion but not their own facts. So we, we do try and... Uh, uh, one of the things we don't do in, in our classes, and let's say talking fifth, sixth grade up, is mm. process. We give them content. We never talk about how science works and who does what and, you know, storytelling. And I think storytelling is an important crucial part of the education of all graduates of high schools and, and colleges. 
And storytelling is just what you want, is, is how did it work? How does science work? How, when does it go wrong? And uh, what can it do and what it can't do? That has to be part of the curriculum. It isn't. I just want to add, national science education in the U.S. is poor, dramatically needs improvement, but for the vast number of people who are lost to the education system um, and on the breaking issues where you need a decision quickly, like global warming, embryonic stem cell research, whatever, education is not the answer. It, it, it has to be some other kind of outreach than education because people, they're lost to the system. And, you know, they're also lost to getting science information in the media because they're just choosing the Food Network, they're just choosing Fox News, whatever it is. So there has to be, you have to reach those people beyond education if you want to move them on a science-related issue that matters on a short time scale. That's one of the reasons why you've been showing things like clips from The Simpsons, and I started by showing you cartoons from The New Yorkers, because they're very effective. I'm just trying to figure out if there's some way of making the, the science stuff as effective in some sort of equivalent sense. Terry, you have a microphone. Yeah, I want to uh, get the feedback from the experts on government and how government works on the idea of trying to educate congressional aides. Now, this seems to be a real pressure point, because, you know, the, the congressmen are really busy. They don't know all the facts, but the aides actually spend a lot of time trying to figure out what the facts are, and actually some of them are pretty smart. And why don't we try to educate them? We, we are, actually, uh, in a number of cases. And I agree with you. I mean, if you want to get faith in, in government, go speak to Congress and speak to the congressional aides who work long hours and, and are very hard, and it, work very hard. And so there are a number of groups. I, I've, for instance, National Academy of Sciences, I, I've gone a few times and spoken to groups uh, of, of aides, uh, congressional aides and, in some sense, Congress people. But you're absolutely right. I think we, we could do a lot more if we had sessions for, uh, where we, sponsored and maybe in nice places where we paid for people to come and we, and we had experts come talk to them in entertaining ways just to give them cultural background. And, and, uh, but I've been very impressed. And actually, invest, when, I've, like, when I've testified for Congress, frankly, I'm actually impressed with the preparation of many of the Congress people, the, at least through their aides, for the questions they ask. Uh, uh, so uh, I think it's a very important area, but there is some work being done in it. Well, plainly, one of the good signs there was when, when you were talking about how people would, would flood around Bill when, when he got into Congress and ask him questions and so on. So if you are a source, at least that's useful. I don't know how well that would work. I mean, in, in Nita's case, where you were talking this morning about the scientists who just wouldn't even, weren't interested in, 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 in the case you were making, how do you get to them? I and mean, what do you do there? To address a question to... Um, uh, Beatrice's talk, which is that yes, you know there is a lot of um, a lot of problems and a lot, and a lot of demonization of the academic industry relationship. But the fact is that so much of the money for clinical trials is from pharmaceutical companies that uh, it, it, it's probably worth spending a lot of effort figuring out how to make it a more reasonable collaboration. And uh, just, just a few examples, the CME, which is Continuing Medical Education Funds, those could be pooled so that they don't go directly to individual investigators or universities, that sort of thing. Um, the same with CME education. In fact, uh, many schools, in my experience, uh, once they get the money for these educational programs, they refuse to allow the drug companies to have any input into who they invite and what the topic is. Um, and a final idea, for example, and this would require a collaboration between journals and, uh, and, um, and the scientists who submit articles and get them published there, is maybe a, a kind of data patenting notion. I mean, we patent drugs, we can patent data. You make all your data available for, let's say, five years, after which time it becomes public domain. But in, within those five years, people can, of course, check your, you know, rerun your stats and check your data. And if they wanted to publish something, they'd collaborate with you about it. If not, they couldn't publish on it. Anyway, those kind. I mean, there are many more ideas, and I'm sure you have a lot, too. But um, it's a little problematic sometimes to demonize the pharmaceutical industry so much because we need them. Well, it, the question is, which is better, biased data or no data? And I'm not sure that giving lots of people dr drugs that may actually be harmful is better than not having evidence one way or another. And I will say that it's a noble ideal to imagine that just be that the funds are unrestricted will mean that the academic institution won't be influenced by them. And the evidence is completely to the contrary. David Healy's example is just one example. It's not the case that Eli Lilly gave University of Toronto those funds with the 
uh, stipulation that they could then influence them in terms of who they would hire in the future. It's the case that the university wants the next pot of money for their future development and they don't want to tick off their potential sponsor. I personally can attest to an instance where I saw academics bought off for approximately $5 a pop. I went to a journal club that was advertised at my hospital by a woman who was actually on our pharmacy and therapeutics committee and therefore not supposed to have any drug company conflict. It was at her house. It was a journal club. The doctors were presenting evidence. I fiat the drug companies aren't allowed to influence those. Uh, the woman who was reviewing the data said, oh, the evidence suggests that estrogen may benefit bone density in the first year and that after that may harm it. I raised my hand mentioned that there had been a UCSF investigator who had given a talk at UC San Diego two weeks earlier suggesting the same was true for the major drug that's used for osteoporosis, alendronate. And this statuesque woman leapt up from her chair, a woman that I didn't recognize, and said, that's not true. I haven't heard that. She turned out to be the drug company representative who was sponsoring the $5 a pop sandwiches at the meeting. And everybody shifted uncomfortably in their seat because it's not just the $5 a pop, it's the fact that she's their hostess. And they said, ha ha, Beatrice, I guess you better give back your dinner, a dinner I did not even know till that point was drug company funded. Ha ha, and that foreclosed future discussion on that issue. So it's a noble ideal to presume that the fact that funds are in some way unrestricted will not influence people, but the evidence does not support that. We had one last comment. Yeah. I, I'll try to be very short. I can't speak so well. fast. So <laughs> I just say less. Um, I think that uh, we criticize the politician, justifiably so. We criticize the public, not so much uh, justifiable, because if you check, you see that the public has more interest in science than we assume. We make the same mistake as the politician to assume that what the public wants and what its interests are is what the media tell us. In any case, we forgot to criticize ourselves at home. If you look among scientists, we are quite illiterate in other disciplines of science. So I think the first uh, test bed to see how we can propagate the interest in science is not to the public, definitely not to the politicians, but to see how we can uh, arise uh, or interest of fellow scientists which are not in the same discipline. This event, it's a very special event. Uh, you hardly have events of this kind at universities, and if you give a popular lecture on one topic, usually even the scientists that work in the topic in this discipline will not come to the event, not to mention other scientists. And you see hundreds of people that come from the public. Okay, so I think that this is one of the things that maybe it's a comment. And last point, I think that to have young uh, faculty the role, it doesn't take much time, but it takes much mental effort to give popular lectures. And I think it will do very good to the young scientists to try to present their work in a popular way uh, to the public or to others, let's start again at home, to other fellow scientists. Mm -hmm. could, could, could you tell the story that you were involved in? Uh, this, is really, this is really very pertinent, and I, it, it involves uh, a, a paper that was published but got publicized in Israel. <laughs> Okay. Well, it's only gonna, it's only going to take a few minutes. But okay. It's worth hearing. Uh, just an, an anecdote. Uh, we wrote an article, which I think it's quite nice, but I think so is about most of our articles. Uh, and we tried to get it published in Nature and Science. It was a bit uh, pioneering, so they say no, despite the fact that it was in the cover letter I wrote the two Nobel Prize winner recommended that it will be considered at least by Nature and Science, but the editor, 25 years old uh, person that didn't know my name, just trash, didn't send it even to referees. Anyway, then we send it to the leading article in physics, it's called Physics of Letter. Uh, they send it to physicists and the biologists, the physicists said great, the biologists said very interesting, not enough physics. How did he know? I have no idea. Uh, so they send it to another art, uh, journal in physics. It's called Rapid Communication in Physics of E, which is interdisciplinary one. And I asked the editor, uh, they said, oh, it's equally important. And I said, when was it a press release on an article that was published in his equally important article of the American Physical Society? Well, they couldn't remember. So we had an agreement, sort of an agreement, that it would be published there, but they will have a press release. Of course, later on, they regretted it, so they decided that they have to meet the premise, but they gave it to a young woman, 22 years old, that you like this story. She finished uh, science, physics, and uh, science writing. 
And uh, she, this is about neuroscience, so it was not easy for a physicist, not to mention neuroscientist. So this, she did a very good job. She contacted me, took a crash course in neuroscience for about a month over the Skype, and then she wrote a very nice story uh, about it, press release. And in the press release, it was the first time that we imprinted uh, multiple memories in neurons outside the brain. But that's not the point. The point is that she used the word cyborg. A step toward cyborg. Cyborg? Mm -hmm. Men... Uh, yeah, cyborg. Better? Cy cyborg? Yes, yeah, cyborg. cyborg. Thanks. Okay. And then it got a whole coverage on the internet. Amazing coverage of the internet because of this world, of course. Some people in Malaysia say that it's no wonder that Israeli do it because now they will put these creatures in the tanks and so on and so forth. <laughs> Well, uh, unfortunately, we're not, well, fortunately, we're not at nearly as such an advanced stage. But then there was a chain of event, and then Scientific American decided to select it uh, as one of the most important uh, scientific achievement in uh, science and technology and, uh, of 2007. And this is just to show you how the media works. And then as a result, of course, the media in Israel picked it, and as a chain continued the chain reaction, the prime minister noticed it, so they invited us, and then the president saw that the prime minister invited us, so the president invited us for several uh, uh, meetings, and I had the chance to talk about science education, thanks to this fact that the paper was rejected. <laughs> and a 22 years old woman decided, first assignment, to do something good. Mere chance, but maybe we can walk chances like that. But there is something else that you're leaving out of your story, which was the student that you took oh, along yeah. with you. Well, this, the other thing was that I, the work was done with a student at Ibaruch. He was a great student, and I insisted that he will be part of the ceremony and the world, and then the media liked it very much. And they came to interview us. I insisted that they would put, ask them to put his picture on the cover page because that will help them a lot. He's good looking also. And the media, uh, people in the media do listen to you if you have some uh, creative and what they think is a fruitful suggestion. So this is an, a newspaper in Israel that has 85% uh, of the cover, of the people read it, and his picture on the cover. And all of a sudden, well, there is one, one thing. Uh, it, by mere coincidence, they put, they, this happened in a rare week in Israel that there was no real event. Namely, missiles from Gaza Strip or the Prime Minister being found guilty of something and so on and so forth. So for a week, all of a sudden, there was interest in science. So you need some singular events. Now, how to design them, I don't know. Well, uh, maybe the other thing is to, I just, w as you were talking, and as we were talking about these different constituencies and people not knowing how to talk to each other and even within the sciences, I'm, I'm going to close this panel now because we have to get to Peter Atkins, but I just went to my computer here because somewhere I keep a, an old clip from Beckett, Samuel Beckett from Waiting for Godot, where Vladimir says to Estragon, um, let us not waste our time in idle discourse. Let us do something while we have the chance. It is not every day that, we're not, that we are needed, not indeed that we personally are needed. Others would meet the case equally well, if not better. To all mankind they were addressed those cries for help still ringing in our ears, but at this place, at this moment in time, all mankind is us, whether we like it or not. So let us make the most, most of it before it's too late. Thank you, panel.